We believe that failed leadership has brought Oregon to the point of a budget uh, crisis, a challenge really of sorts, a challenge that we have done to ourselves, a self-inflicted wound by the failure of leadership in our governor's office and in these chambers, that we have put our kids and our communities in this very difficult spot by spending way more than we had, rolling up costs we knew we couldn't cover, knowing that these decades of deficits were upon us, and yet there was no change. Every effort we made to try to bring the budget back into bounds was refused, and now look at us. Here we have record revenues, record revenues. Over 48 tax increases in the last year, bringing billions of additional dollars into the into the budget, and yet with record revenues and all these tax increases, the three steps from the Oregon business plan that we advocated were ignored. The first step, which we have said, if only the majority party, our friends across the aisle, would join us in this, we could solve so much for Oregon. If only we could agree to grow our economy, conform policy to that growth rate we would have enough money for our children, our communities, for public safety. If, if then we could take our costs that would be accelerating at such a record pace, twice that of inflation, twice that of population increases, accelerating beyond our sustainability, if we could just bring those costs, just turn them down, and come out trajectory, then we would sit down and go, what tax system do we need to have? What revenue do we need to raise? It's with great disappointment that the majority party in this chamber refused step one, refused step two, just went to step three and demanded over and over and over again. And now they're prepared to blame and shame just like they've done forever. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further remonstrances, Representative Barnhart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the uh, Office of Economic Analysis uh, often puts out posts on the economic situation in Oregon. Uh, yesterday they put out one called Kids in the Basement, 2017 update. And they weren't talking about kids, they were talking about adults who are still living uh, or had moved back in with their parents. And I would commend the reading of the entire post to you. Uh, I, I get it in my email and I would think that if uh, if you read the email, you ought to have these posts sent to you because it adds a lot of information about the economic conditions in Oregon. Uh, in this particular post, uh, they, they were talking about uh, a household formation, which of course occurs uh, when people are older, they have uh, mostly completed their education, uh, they have a job, uh, they're in a position where it's possible uh, to move out uh, and actually support themselves. Uh, all of that's, uh, I think, perfectly normal, and we un understand how that actually works. But uh, as uh, Josh uh, Lehner uh, admitted yesterday, that he expected that uh, that that peak basement living of uh, of kids uh, had passed, uh, and he says, "Well, I was wrong. We have not seen the share of young Oregonians living at home decline at all." And later on in his report, he talks about the what he calls the older group. Um, the older millennials living at home, ages 25 to 34. Uh, and he goes on with a bunch of ex reasons why that might be and why they're living at home and why, in many of cases, they're not working at all. Um, I would like to offer an additional reason that is not in this report that we ought to consider. 34 years olds now were 10 in 1993 when Measure 5 first bit in a way that caused the layoff of large numbers of teachers in Oregon. In the case of, of Eugene, where I lived, uh, my son's fifth grade teacher was laid off, along with 99 others in that year. Uh, the 25-year-olds uh, were just born in 1993, and they have never had a schooling experience in the public schools that uh, had adequate uh, 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 adult staff in the building and adequate uh, systems available to them. Um, he doesn't, uh, uh, Josh does not talk about that in his report, and I would commend the report to you. But when we talk about adequate school funding, we talk about meeting the quality education model, this is the kind of result we get when we don't do that. We have unemployed 
uh, people who are well into their, into their adulthood, age 25 to 34, and yet they're still living at home, many without jobs. And I believe that this is part of the reason why it is imperative for the legislature to actually start doing an adequate job of funding the K-12 and university and community colleges education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further remonstrances, Representative Post. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm used to my audience being killed before me, so I'm gonna just continue on with the few people that are here. This booklet came to me from a wonderful lady in Newburgh, who I don't know her age now, but this booklet was printed by the Salem Schools in 1961, and it's called My America, What America Means to Me. They had school kids, first through sixth grade, write little essays about what America meant to them, and it was the coolest thing. First of all, then Governor Mark Hatfield wrote the uh, foreword on it. The then school superintendent, who uh, was Charles D. Schmidt, wrote what America meant to him. This was Salem Public Schools, printed this in 1961. But I just wanted to read, give you an idea where kids were in 1961. I found this just absolutely wonderful. Baker School, second graders, they said, America means happy people. We have many schools, churches, jobs, and we have good things like cars. I mean, the second graders, what do you know? Brush College, fifth and sixth graders said, America is to me a place where all people are equal. It is a place where we can worship God in our own way. At Clear Lake School, grades one and two together said, America is beautiful. We have plenty of food. We have good schools. We have many churches. Grade six said, many people come to America because they have the right to follow any religion they like and they can go to church, any church they like. At Hall's Ferry School, which I don't even think is around anymore, grades one, two, and three said, I love America because I think God loves America too. Grade six said, yes, I am an American, proud of my beautiful country, happy for my flag, family, and friends, glad for the right to have an education, thankful to God for the right to be free. Yes, I am an American. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's beautiful. Hayesville School, Hazel Green School, Lake LaBiche School, and I had to read one last one here. Grade three at Middle Grove School, they said, I love America because we can go to the church we want. We have nice schools, we have nice homes, we have good food. America is the best place in the world. That, that's school children in a public school in 1961. I have no point to make other than, wow, that's amazing. The, a lot of the people in this room, this was probably your generation. This would be kids in 1961 that are now probably around 62 to 63 years old, 57 to 63 years old. That's us for the most part. Well, except for maybe Represent Vile. But outside of that, this is us. So I just thought you would enjoy that. And if anybody wants to take a look at it, it's in my office and I'm looking to get more copies of it. It's really neat what America means to me, school children of 1961. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further remonstrances, Representative Gorsuch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just very briefly, I want to go back to what Representative Doherty was talking about before. Um, I think it's awesome that we, from both sides of the fence, have come together to honor Vic Gilliam. Vic was a wonderful person. Uh, I, I truly loved his company, and I think he was an inspiration to all of us, uh, for those of us who were privileged enough to serve with him. I will tell you that if uh, we saw some of this uh, on the floor here as uh, Vic's illness progressed, I will tell you, though, that I watched my father die from ALS in the course of one year's time. And he passed away in late 1986. And I will tell you, anything that we can do to help with that, um, be it for Vic or you know, for other family members, it is a tremendously bad disease that leaves your mind intact and takes away the rest of your life. So um, I don't think we can do enough for this. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further remonstrances. Adjournment, Representative.